Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Stay tuned to the end of the show to hear how you can get a copy of this program and other helpful documents. And now, it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Thank you, Roger. Today is an exciting day because we're streaming live for the first time from the historical Dreamland Ballroom in downtown Little Rock, Arkansas. If you're a fan of this show or my blog, then you know my staff and I have been struggling with the lack of adequate air conditioning at KABF's radio station all summer. This is our 97th show. That's almost 100. And you know, I'm thinking about doing something special for the 100th show, and I'm not sure exactly what it should be. So if you see this, um, send, me a, send me a Facebook message at Flag and Banner's Facebook page or you can email me and give me some suggestions about what you think I ought to do for the 100th show in three weeks. And if I use your suggestion, I'll send you a free flag and a free flagpole for your house. Um, this show for two years has been broadcasted live from a call-in radio program at KABF. At the same time we were broadcasting the live show at KABF, we would live stream on Facebook and give you this kind of behind the scenes video of us rushing around, getting ready for the show. And then at the breaks, we, you could see us scurrying around trying to fix all the problems. But the temperature in Little Rock, Arkansas has recently surpassed 100 degrees. It was 102, the real temperature was 102, not the heat index. And that just flat run us out of that old hot studio at KABF. Uh, with its subpar air conditioning. And so, for every entrepreneur and dreamer out there, you know life is unpredictable. You start down one path, and pretty soon there is a fork in the road, and off you go. I'm always preaching, you must go where life leads you. Don't be resistant to change. Anybody that knows me has heard that, and you're an entrepreneur, you know this. <laughs> and today it has led us to the Dreamland Ballroom with yet another co-host, Mr. Roger Robinson, who is an outstanding teacher and audio video skills at Metropolitan Technical School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Say hello, Roger. And hello, everyone. I am very glad to be here. And uh, do I go into this part now? You can just okay. say hello. <laughs> so just say, hello, there Roger. You go. Hello, this is my <laughs> introduction. <laughs> Uh, maybe I should ask the listeners to say hello to you. So say hello, Roger. Say hello. This show up in your business with Carrie McCoy began as a radio show only, with entrepreneurs in mind, a platform for me, a small business owner and a guest, to pay forward our experiential, experiential knowledge in a conversational way. As with all new endeavors, like I just said, it's had some unexpected outcomes. For instance, this show has a wider audience appeal than I first thought. After all, who isn't inspired by everyday people's American-made stories? And another discovery I find interesting is that many, many of my guests have a spiritual bent, and they have a heart of a teacher. And business in of itself is creative, more so than I really thought. And last, the one I just talked about, this program was started at a radio show, and it has now morphed into a video production and a podcast. My guest today, Roy Dudley of Roy Dudley Estate Sales, and the first to be interviewed in the Dreamland Ballroom <laughs> is going to teach us about antiques and tell us about the business of reselling. If you're just listening for the first time, you may be asking yourself, what's this lady's story and why should I listen? Well, my newest co-host, Corey, I'm sorry, my newest co-host, Roger, is going to tell you why. Over 40 years ago, with only $400, Karen McCoy founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, the business has grown and changed dramatically from door-to-door -door sales, to telemarketing, to mail order and catalog sales, and now Flag and Banner has a heavy internet presence and includes this newest feature, live chatting, all to improve customer service. With time and experience, Carrie's business and leadership knowledge grew. As early as 2004, she began sharing this knowledge on her weekly blog, and today she uses she uses her learned skills to found the new the nonprofit Friends of Dreamland Ballroom 
as well as the in-house publication Brave Magazine. And now this very podcast and live stream. Each week on this show, you'll hear candid conversations between her and her guests about real world experience on a variety of businesses and topics that we hope you'll find interesting and inspiring. If you would like to ask Carrie a question or share your story, send an email to questions at upyourbusiness.org. That's right. Thank you, Roger. My guest today is Mr. Roy Dudley, founder and owner of Roy Dudley Estate Sales in Little Rock, Arkansas. We've all heard about children who at an early age are lucky enough to discover their passion and have a knack for entrepreneurship. Well, this was Roy Dudley, who grew up accompanying his parents to auctions and as early as elementary school began collecting and had a good eye for selling his finds. His career in treasure hunting was not always on a straight and narrow path. For a time, the younger Roy worked as an account executive at Blue Cross Blue Shield. But on the weekends, he kept his thumb on the pulse of the antique business with booths at local malls, quaint antique shops, and an occasional small-scale estate sale. It was in 2006 that Roy took the entrepreneurial leap of faith and began to concentrate solely on his Roy Dudley estate sale business. Today, he has a warehouse full of treasures for sale. He provides estate appraisals and has an estate mediation services that we're going to learn all about today. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> it is a pleasure to welcome to the table the collector, appraiser, and dealer extraordinaire, Mr. Roy Dudley. Thank you, Carrie. It's great to be here. Welcome to the Dreamland Ballroom. <laughs> it's great, and the first one, yay. It's the be- first one. Yeah. That's right. It's really beautiful here, isn't it? It is really swell. It's a fabulous building. So you began collecting at early as eight years old? Uh, probably a little bit earlier, about six. And uh, I didn't really start collecting. It's, it's really an interesting story. Is, uh, my mother and father decided they were going to build a replica of an 1850s Arkansas cabin. And they wanted it to be authentic. They wanted to be hewn logs, handmade shingles. They wanted everything authentic to the 1850s. So they hired a man to build this cabin on our farm. And my mother decided to go to auctions to buy things to fill the cabin with authentic primitive antiques that would be would have been in the house in 1850. So she wasn't a collector? She was not a collector, just she liked antiques. So we started going to farm auctions in Washington and Madison County, Arkansas. And she would say, I want a wood cook stove. And pretty soon, uh, she would get a wood cook stove for $5. And then the next week, there'd be another wood cook stove. And pretty soon, she would have eight to 10 wood cook stoves or pie safes or kitchen cabinets. And they got stored in the barn. So she sort of became the lady that people from Fayetteville will come out to our farm outside Fayetteville and buy furniture from her. So while she was doing that, of course, I was going to the auctions with her. And she would say, here's $20. You know, you can bid on things too. So I maybe would buy the contents of a porch or the contents of the kitchen. And I would have fun playing with it and setting up camp or whatever I was going to do. Well, my mother had an older sister who had what we call a perpetual yard sale. Oh, there's a lot of those. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) She was on Highway 71 outside Fayetteville. Anyone that went to a Razorback game probably went by her yard sale. So she had this yard sale and she found out I was buying things at the auctions. And she said, okay, bring some stuff and set up with me at the yard sale. So she, my aunt Hazel, her name was Hazel. And I would bring this box and she would say, okay, how much did you pay for the box and contents? And I would say, I paid $6 for this box. And she would say, okay. And she'd root around in the box and she would pull out an item and maybe it was a lamp. And she would say, okay, I'm gonna put $6 on this lamp. And when the lamp sells, your inventory is paid for. And we were gonna keep track of that box by assigning it an initial for R for Roy. So everything in that box was $6. That was my inventory cost. And we would tag and sell those things. And she goes, at the end of the weekend, we'll see how much you made off your $6 investment. And maybe I made $45 off that $6 investment. To a six to eight year old kid, hey, that's, that's bucks. Yeah. So, but also what she was doing, she was teaching me a fabulous lesson in business and economics, uh, profit, profit, how everything works. And at the end of the weekend, she really taught me a strong lesson. And that was, okay, we worked for me all weekend long. You've made $45 off your $6 investment. You have, you know, $39 profit. Right. 
you're going to pay me 20% because I gave you the venue to sell your items. Oh, <laughs> love So she, she taught me all about the inventory cost, the cost of doing business, you know, placing the ad, running the ad, and then working the sale and selling, and then paying her for using her, her expertise and her options of having the sale. So that was my first lesson, and it just that. And you were six or eight years old? Probably six to eight, yeah. I was third and fourth grade, so whatever age that is, probably seven. So yeah. 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 About eight years old. Yeah, and and so that was that was just a lesson, and that just parlayed into a fever, really. You know, it's a chance to, to make money. I mean, all the other kids were like, I'm mowing Mrs. So and So's yard, or I'm raking leaves, I'm making six dollars. I'm like, yeah, I made. 50 bucks wow. this weekend, you know, so I've got it going on. So, so. how'd you, so your mother kept taking you? Kept, to, kept, kept taking, taking me to auctions and then pretty soon I started badgering to go to auctions. So we would go to auctions or estate sales or whatever venue to buy things and, and just go to yard sales and have a good time and buy these things. I continued selling with Aunt Hazel, um, went to college. Got, all the way through All college, the way through. And, and I started selling Hazel. to my mother, my mother's friends, antique dealers I knew. I would sell things to them and making money this whole time. Well, I got out of college and it was the 80s. And anyone that, that had a son in the 80s knows how high our auto insurance was. It was a little different insurance market then. And boys were a higher rate, rate, ranking. So our auto insurance was really high. So out of college, I moved to Little Rock from Fayetteville. And I went to work at Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And my insurance premiums were crazy high. And uh, I wasn't a bad driver. They were just high for my age bracket. And you were driving, you had already moved a little while. Yeah, I removed a little So I was trying to make money. So I started going to local estate sales and once again, buying oh. things and reselling. And pretty soon I had a, a mentor. I've, I've been lucky in my life to have a lot of mentors who've taught me lessons and, and just informed me about business and, and just I really listened to them and my very first mentor besides my mother and my aunt Hazel was John Banks in Fayetteville Arkansas and he was a, a renowned antiques dealer and I moved to Little Rock I was buy, going to estate sales buying stuff and I was selling to John and John said you know I really appreciate you selling these things to me and I, I love that opportunity but I think you should try to sell your things locally so there was oh, a, so get out of wholesale get, into get out of wholesale. exactly mm -hmm. exactly which is a very smart thing to do mm -hmm. and uh so i rented a booth in one of the local antique malls and uh that spawned it all so while i was working at blue cross i had a secondary business in an antique antiques so and you spent your weekends going over there and yeah restocking well i actually spent the weekend shopping and then and then spending a little bit of time saturday or sunday afternoon restocking the booth and making it look good because they're a, it's a manned facility. You, know, you rent a space and you just put the items in and price it and then there's a main desk where the purchases are, are, are made. That's a lot of work. Yeah, but you know, it was a, a good money. You gotta love it. it I absolutely, I love antiques. I love my job, I always have. It's something that, that I always enjoy doing. And while I enjoy my job at Blue Cross and I was good at my job, it wasn't what I was meant to do. And I think we you all- just tell. Yeah, we all know that businesses, we have our gift and, and that my gift is definitely you know, with antiques. So what made you decide to leave, leave Blue Cross Blue Shield? I did not make that decision. I worked for <laughs> Yeah, I worked for a subsidiary of Blue Cross, which was called US Able Systems. And we sell computer software packages to other Blue Cross plans, which is already a very limited market, you know, 50 plans in America or oh, less. Really? Okay. So um, the subsidiary I worked for, Blue Cross, the parent company, decided to close us down in 2000. And at that point, I was 36. And I thought, oh, I can go on into Alltel, Axiom, other same top arenas. Uh, Blue Cross of Oregon offered me a chance to go back there. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try to wing this and do something myself. I'm, I'm really frustrated working for a company where I don't get to make the rules. And I want to see if I can do what my passion is. And my goal was to find a way to make a living out of being Roy Dudley, not being Roy Dudley, the software person, the account manager, Roy Dudley, anything. I wanted to make a living out of my passion, which was antiques and sharing that knowledge and meeting the people getting out in the trenches and working with that. And that's what I wanted to do. So I said, I'm going to work and try to make a living out of being myself. And here we are in 2018 and seven people make a full-time living out of Roy Dudley. I have oh, seven, really? yeah. seven employees. I have seven full-time employees. I had no idea. So yeah, so you know, so basically, my dream of being self, 
sufficient and doing my passion has parlayed into a business. Into helping other people too. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I have a, a, a great job. Yeah. Great job. All right, this is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Roy Dudley, founder of Roy Dudley Estate Sales. We'll talk about antiques, how to tell a good one from a reproduction, about the do's and don'ts of restoration. I don't know if y'all heard about the Ming vase that was recently turned into a lamp. We'll talk about that. And we'll continue talking about the business side of treasure hunting. More to come right after this. Want to create excitement for your business or event? Do it with affordable advertising from Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. We have teardrop banners, retractable banners, and table drapes. We have street pole banners, museum and exhibit banners. We have custom flags, event tents, tailgating poles, auto graphics, and window scrim. And don't forget, welcome home and sale banners. Consult the experts at Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. Go online for a free quote or drop by our historic showroom at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly I found my voice and learned all the way I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Boost morale and patriotism with a new flag or flagpole from Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. We have poles, hardware, accessories, maintenance support, installation, and custom flags. We have flags of all kind for the sports enthusiast, the world traveler, or history buff. We have them all. Bring in your old flag and get $5 off a new one. Consult the experts at Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. Come shop our historic location at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock or visit us online at FlagandBanner.com. Before the break, we were talking to Roy Dudley because you're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy and I'm speaking today with Mr. Roy Dudley, founder of Roy Dudley Estate Sales in Little Rock, Arkansas. And before the break, I was going to say we were talking about you becoming a uh, capitalist at the age of eight. <laughs> at a very early age. Thank yes. you, Aunt Hazel. No, really, I think that is wonderful. Yeah. I wish more people had the opportunity and more children had the opportunity to learn just about free trade and you just yes. buy and sell and buy and sell. Yeah. So I'm going to tell the listeners that you, uh, you at the age of eight, bought a truckload of uh, junk off of somebody's yeah. porch, which they probably should have paid you to take, actually. Exactly, you know, right. For like, what did you buy, six, six dollars six or something? Six bucks, yeah. And you took it to your Aunt Hazel, who taught you how to flea market it, and you turned it into $45, right. and a star was born, an entrepreneur was born from that point forward. So when you first left Blue Cross Blue Shield to go out on your own, yes. and you also then, by the time you left high school and went off to college, and you were just really deep in antiques by now. Right. And even when you had your Blue Cross Blue Shield yes. real job as an account really. executive, your yes. real serious job, you kept an antique uh, business going yes. in an antique mall. Yes. But now that you've made the commitment, right, and you've quit your job or been laid off or whatever, you're moving on to be the real Roy Dudley's going out right. on your own. You're going to live off of the money you make. No right. more side, exactly. no more right. on the side. What was the first thing you did? Um, well. Uh, I just hit my feet running because to me, to me, uh, I have to keep moving. I had, I need, I needed to get something going. I was a little paranoid that it wasn't going to work. So I worked a lot of hours and, um, I started estate sales. I opened an antique shop. I continued my booth. I continued just doing anything that would make money. And, and my advice to someone starting a business like that is I, I didn't have a business plan. I think business plans 
are great. I think they're important. But you know, in my case, I didn't have a business plan. I think if I had a business plan, it wouldn't have worked. I think that I mean, they never, they never, you never follow. Them. I, I, you never follow, them, and I think that everyone would have laughed at me and said, "This is not a business that's viable. It's not something that that's going to generate employees." Um, well, you income. didn't have to borrow any money, though. No, that's the thing. I did exactly. There didn't need to be a business plan because I had those antique mall booths that were up and running, generating money. I had inventory. I just needed to parlay and keep doing that. You just need to grow it. Right. Exactly. Which, which is like if you're going to borrow money from a bank, right? Start a brand new startup that you don't have, right. you know anything about. You've got right. a the business plan is almost an exercise for you to go through and right. think about everything because I have done business plans. Yes, absolutely. And by the time I got to the bottom of it, I was like, well, I'm not doing that. Yeah, see, that, that's what I think. I think if I really had had not had the the innocence of youth, I think I, I, I think I might have, have said. Oh, I don't think I think I might just go to work for Axiom and forget this. But I think I I was like, okay, I can do this. I was a dreamer, mm -hmm. and I think that I think that that's what we we need to, to remember in business. And something that you touched upon, I want to go back on just a bit, and it's something that you're inspiring me with, and that's the fact that you grew your business organically. And I think that we all, if if we just go with our hearts, our business will follow us. I believe that. I think if you're coming from a pure spot and you're working your hardest, your business will follow. I, I really you know, do. also, you're hardworking. Yeah. I mean, people sometimes talk about, you know, how hard it is to be a dreamer and to right. start do a startup. You've got to be a hard worker. There's you no do. secret out there. No, Nobody's there, no, just no, real there, lucky. There's, there's not a magic bean. You know, I didn't draw a salary for two years. I believe that. You know, I mean, I, I lived. I off, just, I just of lived. Well, I lived off my IRA from Blue Cross. Oh, you I did? Yeah, I had to, I had to yeah. tap into that. Well, that you was know, a penalty. It was absolutely a penalty for starting your own business. I had to pay my own health insurance, which I'd never had to pay an mm. independent health insurance policy mm. before. So there were lots of expenses that I really didn't take into account. But I, I did was not able to draw a salary because all that money was going back into my business. And you couldn't. That's right. And you couldn't really uh, get a part-time job because you spent so much time having. Into yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 you, if you want to at that point, if you want to get the merchandise, you've got to get up early to get to those yard sales, to get to those auctions, to get to Talk the about estate that. sales. Yeah. Talk about that getting up early and going. To oh the my gosh! I can't stand that part of your business. Well, you know, it's 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 you have to have the energized motivation to get up and go. But and it's, it's nerve wracking. It's very nerve wracking. It's very nerve wracking. You I, still do that? No, I don't. Oh, I, you know, but but. As my business grew, I left the antique shop and the mall booths aside. I no longer do that. I focus just on estate sales and I'm selling other people's stuff. So I'm not buying stuff to resell for myself now. I'm just selling other people's items. But you know, there was a time and there's a, a great story that some friends and I went, heard about a great sale in Stuttgart and we left Little Rock at 2 a.m. And got to Stuttgart at four, the sale started at eight and we sat in front of the house you know, for four hours so that was motivation. Were you the first one? Yes, we were the we were the first four in the door. So, I haven't been back to Stuttgart. I don't think they would welcome me back. Why? We were we were, we were a tough group to shop behind. Did you buy they them everything? Me back. Did you buy everything out? We did. We bought just about everything in the house. So. You had a mission. Yeah. Yeah. So where do you keep your inventory? I know that's a big thing when you're a junk well, collector. Well, we, we uh, you I know. I mean, say junk. I mean, antique I know, collector. I know. But, uh, <laughs> there's Treasure a million hunting. words. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm offended by none of them. Uh, we, uh, I have a space at Tanglewood, which is at Cantrell, Mississippi. There's a Tanglewood shopping center. We have a showroom there that's about 5,200 square feet. Uh, we have a large uh, 6,000 square foot warehouse near Central High. Wow. where we store uh, additional items for estates. How much inventory do you have? Uh, actually, that's the interesting part of my business. As we get into the business, I have very little physical inventory. I own my signs. I own my, my sales equipment. But everything I sell belongs to someone else. I work purely on commission. So you may have it all in your warehouse, right, but I'm, it's not yours. You may call You're me and say- You're storing it, right, basically. Right, really, you may call me and say, Roy, I've got to empty my house. Uh, I need it out of my my house is sold. It needs to be gone. Do they pay you a storage fee? No. I, I work on a, my commission includes the storage, the moving, everything. Okay, so go ahead and say they call you up and say, Droy, I need to run." My house is empty. I need to get out of here. And you know, sometimes they want a house space sale where we have a sale in in the neighborhood in the house, or we may, may need to move the items, and then we either move them A to our showroom or B to the warehouse. So and if it goes to the warehouse, how long does it sit there? Uh, we try to get it out within two to three months. 
but you know sometimes so you, you have that much warehouse that turns over every two to three months yes it, it is it is phenomenal the amount of things that go through Roy Dudley estate sales hands how it's, many employees did you say you had we have seven full-time employees and we have a pool of about 15 part-timers that can help so you just call them in and say say well you know maybe it's like well, we had a sale a few years ago in uh, Greenbrier. We had to call in anyone that could do any form of appraising. We've got movers. We've got people who clean, uh, pricers. I have a lot of people who have a decorating vent that can help me decorate with the stuff. So, is there something you're exceptionally good at finding and collecting? I have a I have a sort of an innate ability of understanding what Carrie McCoy wants and remembering what she wants. Really? So it's it's a it's a it's a neat ability, but I can say, uh, I mean, we're we're processing stuff, and, and the whole staff and, and all the customers should not laugh about it because I can pull a, a teapot out and say, oh, Carrie McCoy's going to buy this, and everyone laughs, and then Carrie McCoy comes in and buys the teapot. So I ha that's that's sort of my ability. I also have a good ability to tell an antique and a fake. I can, I, that's a, a... Let's talk about that. How do you do that? Well, you know, it depends on what different item it is. And, and the one thing I like to clear up for maybe the novice to know is for an antique has to be 100 years old to be qualified for an antique. Right. So uh, a lot of people who say they are antiques dealers or an antique mall or something, they may not necessarily be selling antiques. So as a customer, you need to know that. They're, they're more like periods. Like right, they're buying exactly. the 50s. Right, right, 20s. exactly. Yeah, something from the 50s is highly collectible, yes. but it's not an antique. Correct. It's vintage. Uh, so basically, you know, there's with each category, um, you know, you can tell with paper if it's if, if it's a, an, a a piece of vintage paper, it's going to be over 100 years old. It's going to have a rag content, which means it has some fabric mixed in with the pulp to, have, to give the paper a different feel. Construction, you know, as far as the techniques inside the drawers, underneath. Uh, everyone looks at the exterior of a table and think, oh, that's the great thing. I can tell you more about the table by looking underneath it or underneath a chair. You can tell more about the construction, the age, but not necessarily the finish and the appearance, but the construction. And that's going to tell you, you a lot. Are you self-taught on all of that? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, self-taught to some degree. You know, John Banks was a phenomenal influence. I talked about him being the infamous, the late John Banks, a great Fayetteville antiques dealer who I apprenticed with by his side for three or four years. And he taught me incredible things about that. There are other dealers who always share their knowledge. Um, and then, of course, perusing uh, antique valuation guides, uh, coffee table books. I'm constantly you, you looking. Watch, you watch the Antique Roadshow? I don't watch the Antiques Roadshow very much. I, I do. That, that's <laughs> actually, that's, you talk about something like, you know, getting up and going to an estate sale does not make me nervous, but watching the Antiques Roadshow makes Why? me nervous. Why? I don't know. It just, it, it's, I guess, I guess maybe I'm so excited and I, I, I also don't want ever to disappoint a person. And I think sometimes the valuations they give are a little bit unrealistic. Oh. So, you know, they're doing it for a little bit. It's reality television to some degree. They're doing it to get a little splash. That's probably why you don't like it. Because <laughs> Maybe you know so. it's not really real. Maybe so. That's the Maybe truth so. with everything. So running an antique store sounds really hard. So, when, Run, running an antique store yes. sounds really hard. And you did that before you were Roy yes. Estate. Yes. Yeah, I had, I've, had, I've had three antique shops here in Little Rock. A lot of people don't remember that. But I've had, I've had two shops on Kavanaugh and one on Cantrell. And, and it's, a, it's a different world. It's a slower pace. Yeah. Uh, and you've got to turn that merchandise over and get the reason for people to come into the door. They want to, they want to see you. They want to buy something from the owner. And they want your merchandise to change and be new. And that, that's, that would be my advice. And you've got to be there. Did you, have, did you keep it open 8 to 5, Monday through Friday? Or, uh, Monday I was, through Saturday I was 11, or to, 11 to 5, uh, Six Tuesday, days a week? Tuesday through Saturday. I was closed Sunday and Monday. Because you had to have time to go shopping. Had to have time to go shopping. But it, it, it's, it's a commitment. It's a big commitment. Um, and you know, people lo love to shop with the owner. They want to talk with you. So if you were going to give advice to a collector who wants to support his habit, which is right. a lot of people have these habits. Right. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I, do, I do know that. I do see, oh, I see, yeah. I see, I see some, some uh, uh, habits. Do you recommend getting an antique, a booth at an antique mall to yeah. kind of push your stuff out the door so that you can turn it over a little bit? Yeah. The one thing I think that most really serious collectors do wind up dealers. But I think the one thing to do is to, to learn, and that is, that is to talk to other dealers. 
watch what people are buying, watch shoppers, check, you know, now we have, we're so blessed to have Facebook and Instagram and a million other things that you can actually get your finger on the pulse of what people are talking about, what's generating buzz that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think uh, watch your auction sites, eBay, uh, One King's Lane, First Dibs, look at all those places and learn from those, those uh, other dealers, learn that. Uh, and I think a booth is a good place to start, but also go in realistically and know that just, you know, the, there's a, a, people say, if I pay $50 for this, I want them to double my money. That's not always an option. You know, that, I would think that's not very much. Not but very don't much. Don't you have to pay the, the flea market? Right. And that, that's what some people say. People come to me and they say, hey, I've made my rent this month. I've made money. No, you haven't. You've lost money because you've got your cost of inventory. You have your insurance. You have your taxes. You have your, your, your space rental. So, you know, there's a lot of factors besides just making your space rental money. Do you compete with people that don't have business permits? Yes. That, that is, you know, that you do. And, and that, I would that's think that would be big in your industry. People would not get business permits. Well, and that's something that we've talked a lot about the state sale industry. The auction world is regulated by standards and ethics and, and rules. The estate sale liquidator com world is not. You know, technically anyone can throw their hand out there and say, I'm doing an estate sale. But, you know, um, you need to, to be educated, have a license, so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think this is a great place for us to take another break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Roy Dudley, founder of Roy Dudley Estate Sales. We'll have him explain the do's and don'ts of antiquing and restoring because restoration is a big deal. I know you're not supposed to restore a lot of stuff. And we'll talk more about the business of treasure hunting. I also want to take this opportunity, opportunity to tell everyone that we are streaming live from the historical Dreamland Ballroom in downtown Little Rock, Arkansas and that a podcast of this show will be made available at wherever you like to listen or subscribe. In addition, each Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you can listen to an Up In Your Business pre-recorded show at KABF 88.3 FM, The Voice of the People. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Want to create excitement for your business or event? Do it with affordable advertising from Arkansas's flagandbanner.com. We have teardrop banners, retractable banners, and table drapes. We have street pole banners, museum and exhibit banners. We have custom flags, event tents, tailgating poles, auto graphics, and window scrim. And don't forget, welcome home and sale banners. Consult the experts at arkansasflagandbanner.com. Go online for a free quote or drop by our historic showroom at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Boost morale and patriotism with a new flag or flagpole from ArkansasFlagandBanner.com. We have poles, hardware, accessories, maintenance support, installation, and custom flags. We have flags of all kinds for the sports enthusiast, the world traveler, or history buff. We have them all. Bring in your old flag and get $5 off a new one. Consult the experts at ArkansasFlagandBanner.com. Come shop our historic location at 800 West Knight Street in Little Rock or visit us online at FlagandBanner.com. You are listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with Mr. Roy Dudley, founder of Roy Dudley Estate Sales in Little Rock, Arkansas. If you have a question you'd like to ask either one of us, you can send an email to questions, that's questions with an S, at upyourbusiness.org. I have got my, uh, I've got my internet up and I am looking right now if you want to send me a question. That's questions with an S at upyourbusiness.org. Or you can tweet me at Ask Carrie McCoy, and that's K-E-R-R-Y, McCoy, M-C-C-O-Y. 
And if you're shy, I mean, it's social media world now. If you're shy, you can just creep on my weekly blog about life as a small business at Arkansas Flag and Banner. <laughs> and as I said earlier, all of this is being made into podcasts that are available wherever you like to get your podcasts from. Before the break, we were talking about you. Well, we don't, I don't know if we want to go all the way back. <laughs> we, we talked about you starting your business when you were learning capitalism when you were eight years old from <laughs> Aunt Hazel, and then we talked about you leaving the corporate world and going out on your own. And right. and like so many entrepreneurs say, you spent two years, yes, putting your money back into your business. Yes, Every, I did the same thing. Yeah. I think that you just need to be prepared to do that. Yes. I, I think it's interesting that you even use part of your IRA and retirement to do it. That means you are really committed. I was committed, yeah. You were really committed, and you st when you left Blue Cross Blue Shield, you started out with antique stores. Right. Uh, antique malls, yes. which you always kept all your life, uh -huh. and then antique, got serious with antique stores, and you had to spend your weekends running around finding these Find treasures. It, right. So it's a exactly. seven day a week job. Yes, absolutely. All the time. Absolutely. And somewhere in there, you decided, you were also doing small estate sales, but somewhere in yes. there you decided to get out of a retail storefront and go strictly into Roy Dudley estate sales. Right. How did that come about? Well, it, it came about in a very odd way. And I think that we talk about how businesses grow organically. Yeah. And uh, I was doing just small estate sales in homes and everything was, was growing great. And uh, someone, there was a, a gift shop in the Heights that went out of business. And uh, the, the lady- Which one? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It, actually, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, uh, Samuel, Lila Samuel passed away. Oh, okay. And I'm going to give them a, a great amount of credit, Mr. Samuel, for sort of inspiring me and going on. Um, he called me and said, Roy, my wife has passed away and we're needing to liquidate the shop. And we have a few things of hers from the house that we want to sell. Would you be interested in doing a sale in our retail environment? And I was like, and he said, and she's got some friends who want to sell some stuff. And I was like, well, you know, sure, I'll do that. And that afternoon, my phone rang 17 times from 17 people who wanted to sell a few things. They didn't want a house based to sell. Maybe they didn't have enough for a house based to sell, but they had things they wanted to sell. So they heard I was doing a sale in the Excedra building. So 30 consigners later, we had a sale in the Excedra building in the Heights. It was a great success. Organically, I thought, hey, there's a market for people who maybe don't have enough to have a whole house-based estate sale. So we started what we call our showroom, which is an empty room like this, mm -hmm. and 30 people bring stuff in, we decorate it, keep their initials straight, just like Aunt Hazel. So you know, here we are, grown up, I'm still doing what Aunt Hazel did, <laughs> which is tagging things with initials, and we're selling things for other people. And that parlayed into the bulk of our business and doing our showroom sales. And our showroom is at Cantrell, Mississippi. And that's, you know, each one of those sales probably has 30 consigners. So you just kind of let your lease run out on your buildings mm -hmm. on, and took all that stuff yep. and moved it in? Yeah, I just, I just decided, you know, this is, um, I can't do the antiques business justice. I'm not out there finding stuff. I'm not in the shop enough to take care of the people. Mm -hmm. So I was just gonna go to estate sales. And estate sales are really great for me because um, I meet lots of new shoppers. Yeah. I meet lots of new consumers honors and the stuff when a shop can get stale you get tired of it with an estate sale it all goes away within a matter of three weeks so it's not you know is you, you don't get tired of your inventory it's a great situation for but you me. have to move it around yes. all the time yes and, and that, when I see you that's, it, it, that's yeah. the cost you know I have to I have to and, and a good example is if you call me and said well I need to sell this stuff in our house I'm gonna come to your house and visit you I'm going to send, come back with my guys, or my guys are going to come and they're going to pack your things up, so they're going to touch it, pack it up. It's going to go on our truck where it falls under my insurance policy. It's going to be moved to our Tanglewood location where I'm going to pay someone to unpack it. We're going to clean it. We're going to tag it. We're going to arrange it and make it look pretty with everybody else's stuff. Then we're going to have a public sale which I will pay for advertising, I'm paying the lease on the building, and then we're going to carry, when, when someone else comes in and they want to buy something, we're gonna carry it to the cashier, we're gonna wrap it, we're gonna record it so the proper consigners are paid, and we're gonna carry it out the door. That's a lot of steps. So it's a lot of steps and a lot of, of You've gotta of trust your people. 
oh, I have the best employees. But yes, you do have to trust your people. And, and, and to some degree, the customers have to trust us completely too, that A, that we're going to take care of their stuff and that we know what we're doing, that we're going to sell it for a fair so amount. So how often do you open up your warehouse? We open the, the warehouse up about every six weeks. And our warehouse sales run three weekends. So we have a, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday weekend where everything is full price close, reopen the next Friday, Saturday, Sunday, everything is 20% off, close, reopen the third weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, everything is 50% off. At the end of that cycle, someone, I have a wholesaler who comes and buys everything that's left, the building is empty, we start all over again. So our in, the inventory that the customer sees of Roy Dudley will change every, every six Every three months? Yeah, every six weeks. So that, yeah, it changes every six weeks. I am so yeah, and impressed. I had no idea. No one, no one really is. And, and, and it's when you think, we probably go around 350 consigners so in a year. So in one year, I'm dealing with roughly 350 individuals or families that we deal with. So that's sort of how our business works. And, and the showroom sales, we still do house-based sales because there are people who may That's want- That's where I always yeah. see Well, and you, you tell the great story because I was doing like sales all around your personal house and you said, I'm nailing my furniture down, you're getting too close. Because, <laughs> because I had done like three sales around you. But we still do house-based sales, but there are more and more instances where people, new home buyers maybe don't want someone in the house. Uh, maybe people live in a gated community, the neighborhoods where they have covenants where you can't have sales. There are lots of reasons that people don't want to have a sale in the house anymore. And that's where our showroom really takes off and helps out. Part of the fun of coming your sales in the houses though is to see, see the, the house. house. I He's went to one of your shows a month ago downtown across yes. the Yes, oh Mansion. beautiful house, beautiful house. And it sold us all the other day. Yeah, it sold actually the, the night before the sale. Oh, it did? Yeah, but no, that's a, uh, that's part of it and a lot of people do love to see the houses and that that's a charm and, and and the one thing when someone calls me I'm going to be able to give them advice and saying we're going to make more money if we can do the sale of your stuff out of the house where people will be curious to come see the house or or, or it sets a real personality or maybe it's just best to add it into a showroom and a lot of people want confidentiality from selling their stuff you know a lot of people want don't yeah. want people to know they're selling their things it's a sin yeah so yeah. when you go into one of your sales, even if it's in somebody's home, you mm. may have brought stuff in from another We, we place. very rarely do that. Oh, okay. Yeah, most everything with our showroom, we we would take the things into our showroom with a house space to sell. We're going to keep everything that's in the house, and not, not bring other stuff in. That's kind of easier to keep up with because you don't have to yes. keep with a It is a nightmare. Plus, if you're going if I'm going to represent you, I want to bring your stuff into a 3 weekend sale, not a 3-day sale. And what a sensitive subject. What? It's such a sensitive subject. Oh. I mean, Grandma has just died, it's, and it, all the kids want her yeah. stuff. How <laughs> yes. do you deal with that? Well, it's you know, it, I, and I, it's something I tell all of our, my staff. We we reiterate to each other all the time, but we particularly are focused on with our new employees. But we come to end someone's life at a very emotional time. You know, the easiest situation we come to is a move. Maybe you're moving and you've got stuff you want to sell. We come in and everyone knows moves aren't easy. And we come in in divorces and bankruptcies and mm. deaths and you know and you emotions. Are you a degree in psychology? I should, <laughs> I do now. <laughs> <laughs> and, me and mediation. But you know, the one thing people need to remember is just because you, you love your grandmother, you love your mother and, and as we all should, but you don't have to have their possession to have that memory. You just need one of them. You don't need all yeah, of them. You know, you don't have to, uh, don't burden yourself with that. You still have your memory just because you don't have the punch bowl. You still remember grandma's punch. <laughs> That's right. That's a nice way to say it. Yeah. How do you, what, uh, what percentage is about do you normally take off of something like uh, that? We, we 50%? are. 50%? Uh, no. 50%? Of, we, we are somewhere between 35 and 50% depending on the estate yeah, I mean, and the I, location. After I list, listen to all the steps yeah. you have in there and all the people you have yeah. to pay and the insurance and the yeah. taxes I, and the moving it around and right. all of that. Workers comp. I know. Things that we don't think about that, that you have to have. What's the best thing you've ever found? Is there one thing that sticks out in your mind? <laughs> the one thing that sticks out in my mind, it's a little bit of a story, but I think we have a bit of a ch time. Um, we were doing a sale for a very old family here in Little Rock. And uh, the, they had actually built the house in 1870. And it was some out-of-state heirs. And they called and they said, um, 
would you come out and look at our sale? We, we'd be interested in you doing it. So I drove out and met them. And when I pulled in front of the house, there was a dumpster in front of the house. And it was one that you rented from Lowe's. And they would come haul it away. And it was full of all this stuff. And I went in the house. I met the nieces and nephew. And I said, what's in the dumpster? And they said, oh, we cleaned the attic out this morning. And I was like, no, 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 don't do that. And they're like, well, we already have Lowe's coming to pick the dumpster up. And I said, well, would you mind if I brought my guys out and we pulled the dumpster under the carport and then we'll still call them but give me a chance to go through the dumpster first and they're like sure so we go through the dumpster and what we didn't know and they didn't tell me which the best part of my job is being a detective so we're in this dumpster and we're going through and we find this binder and what we discovered that we knew we were working for their maiden aunt that had never married well there were two sisters who never married in this family and they stayed in the family home and they were emptying their things out of the attic and one of the sisters was an art teacher and she taught art at the Rower uh, internment camp in Rower, Arkansas for the Japanese oh, Americans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she taught art there every summer and she saved, I'm getting chill bumps talking about it, she saved all of the children's art and she had a journal for every day she was there in the camp and what was going on and the people's names and the personal art that the kids drew and also that adults drew because the, the classes were for everyone. So there's just this incredible capsule of, of uh, a sad time of America and it's this capsule An and I'm proud time. to say that collection is now in the University of Arkansas and we were able to pull out of a dumpster and get it to people so that everyone can enjoy it. And that's one of the finds I'm most proud of is the fact that we pulled something out of its imminent death. It was going to the dump and it got to where everyone can enjoy it and everyone can sort of see what was going on in those people's everyday life. It's a historically significant. Yeah, it was, it was very significant and it was great that we had a part in that. I love that. Yeah. Let's take another break. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Roy Dudley, founder of Roy Dudley Estate Sales. We'll talk about restoration, the do's and don'ts, because somebody turned a Ming vase into a lamp. We're going to ask him about that. Want to create excitement for your business or event? Do it with affordable advertising from Arkansas's flagandbanner.com. We have teardrop banners, retractable banners, and table drapes. We have street pole banners, museum and exhibit banners. We have custom flags, event tents, tailgating poles, auto graphics, and window scrims. And don't forget, welcome home and sale banners. Consult the experts at ArkansasFlagandBanner.com. Go online for a free quote or drop by our historic showroom at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Boost morale and patriotism with a new flag or flagpole from Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. We have poles, hardware, accessories, maintenance support, installation, and custom flags. We have flags of all kinds for the sports enthusiast, the world traveler, or history buff, we have them all. Bring in your old flag and get $5 off a new one. Consult the experts at ArkansasFlagandBanner.com. Come shop our historic location at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock or visit us online at FlagandBanner.com. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with Mr. Roy Dudley of Roy Dudley Estates in downtown Little Rock, Arkansas's Dreamland Ballroom is where we're broadcasting from. I guess you call it live streaming now. It's not broadcasting anymore. Uh -huh. Before we went to break, we were talking about the business of uh, estate sales, and I think it's fascinating how many steps you have to go through. Yes. Uh, we talked about the psychology of working with the families. That's a big deal. And then we talked about how, what I like about the state sale business is you don't have any inventory. All no. the inventory is... is Your what, equipment. Yeah. And I the inventory belongs to someone else. Yeah, I love that. Consignment, yeah. I guess you'd call it. Yeah, it's it all consignment. Yeah. yeah. 
And, uh, and then we talked about how much work goes into getting ready for right. an estate sale. You've got to go, of course, go get make the sale, look at the stuff, right. Right. then box it up gingerly and gingerly, gingerly correctly. and correctly and take it back to your place, right. clean it, label it, price it, then either move it again or display it in a way. Right. Um, Attractively. Uh-huh. And then you have to keep up with uh, who's, who, who, where it who came belongs. from, who it belongs to, so you can pay the right. consignment money right. back Play to the them. consignment back to the people, exactly. Yeah, so and, it's, and it's then, pretty And then the one, the one thing we haven't entered, which is one of my favorite parts of the business, is dealing with the public. You know, because you don't know. You what's, like that part? I do, because you don't know what's going to walk in the door. I mean, a circus well, may a circus sure. may walk in the door, <laughs> and yeah, you know, I like that. I like people. So, it, but you know, you, you are also dealing with a variable of the public. Oh yeah, you are. Okay. Yeah. I've been doing it for forty-two years. Yeah, and that's when you have to remember that customer ser those customer service mantras, and you know, and that's what allows us to have a business. Are those people walking in and the I door? And I tell you, well, that it's better face to face because I yes. do a lot of email and internet, and mm. man, they get on those emails sometimes, and well, they can be crazy a little well, bit. Well, and, and and of course, in our world of seeing, you know, social media has changed everything too, and I and I get comments on social media posts that in reality. They would never do. Oh, they would oh never no one say. would ever say those things. I, that's kind of yeah. bizarre. Yeah. So let's talk about restoring something. Okay. This drives okay. me crazy. Okay. It drives me crazy that people buy stuff, sand it down, and right. put new varnish on it. Well, Is that or, right or wrong? Well, and now particularly, you know, it's the chalk painting phase. So people are What's painting that mean? everything. Well, they, they, there's a paint that, that has a, a chalk formula mixed in it, and everyone is painting these sort of milk paint weathered pieces. And, and I'm selling a ton of furniture, traditional furniture, that people are painting that may have a wood finish when it leaves me, but in a few weeks it's gonna have a painted finish. Painted furniture comes in and yes, out Yes, and it, of right style. now it's very in, so. I don't even feel like antiques are really popular right now, do you? No, they're not, they're not. I mean, there and, was a time. Those are, well, the 80s and 90s when I had those booths in that shop, that was the time. Oak now, tables were the craze. Yeah, oh, everyone wanted really everything. You could sell most anything then. Now it's a really, it's a harder market um, and Antiques aren't in favor. They still have value. They just don't have the value of what you may have paid for them in the 80s or 90s. Yeah, because people are liking modern furniture. They are, and also you have to realize that we're, we're now, I'm now liquidating the baby boomer generation of stuff, and that's the largest generation in America. So there, maybe there's there, right now there's such a saturation of goods on the market from people downsizing. Oh, there's yeah. such a huge downsizing phase and their kids don't want it the kids want modern or maybe they want minimal or they you know Minimalism they want is so in right well they want as a good friend of mine in st louis told me which he was very astute and very wise he said they all want an antique and, and one antique. one yeah. you know they want the great antique in their dining room they don't want an antique dining room they want just one thing that everyone says oh that's neat it's an old bicycle great um, on rest, restoring antiques, I have a, 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 a different theory. There's an intellectual, um, educated theory, and then there's the live with theory. And I, my, I'll go to, you have to live with your antiques. The, that's the beauty of having antique is that you get to enjoy it and live with it. And you need to modify that to your life. Now, 90% of the things that we see that people call as antiques are not antiques. So do the new finish, paint them, live with them. But there are antiques that have the original finish. Drilling a vase is not good. People do things to metals and silver. Always just consult with someone who knows something before you yeah. do it and say, hey, it's, I get people calling me all the time. They're saying, hey, I have this, this dresser. Is it, should I refinish it? And that's a five minute question for me and I'm always happy to answer those oh, because that's nice. yeah because, how do people call you yeah how do people get in touch with you oh they get in touch with me they can they can call we have two business numbers 501-666-1344 that was so fast yeah 501-666-58 uh, we'll 56. put that on flag and banner yeah, website with yeah. your podcast so if anybody yeah. wants it we'll put the link there thank you and thank you, you said there was another number uh, and, the, and my cell phone 590 you don't 5, need 2, to 4, give your cell phone out oh it's all they all roll the one number they do yeah yeah, I, I want. I have found in my business that people want to talk to me. I've had employees that monitor phones. I've had other people try to take over the phones. But basically, that's the most important job, and that's the face of our company, and that's talking to those new customers, talking to those existing customers, and maybe even talking to someone who's not a customer. That's that's the most important job for a business owner is to be that face of that business. You have a lot of repeat business. Your oh, word of yes. mouth is huge. Yeah, it's huge, and I'm I'm very proud to say now I'm working with. 
with three generations. There are some families that I've worked with liquidating the grandmother stuff. I've worked with the mother. I'm working with the daughter. You know, and it's, it's, it's pleasing to know that people are coming back generational. If you could tell yourself something of 20 years ago, what would it be? Uh, That's a hard one. Be more selective in everything in life. Oh, that's a good one. I love that. But I, th I think probably I would probably have uh, slowed down a little bit, um, work hard in your business, getting your business built, and then be selective of where your business goes. That you don't need to please everyone; you need to please yourself. That's right. You can't please everybody. Yeah. yeah. And I and and I was going to ask you who was probably left the biggest impression in your life, and you know who 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 was who's the person that kind of made you who you are today. Is it Hazel or Bass? Well, uh, uh, or your parents, I guess. Uh, well, you know, uh, everyone, all parents different phases. Again. Parents, Aunt Hazel was instrumental. John Banks, uh, Banks, a lady in town, Adrian Cockrell, who did estate sales, has given me numeral uh, crazy advice. June Blankenship, the late June Blankenship. Yeah. They all have shared their knowledge, and that's something I work really hard. I want to share my knowledge with someone new. Oh, I love it. So I'll put a link to how to get in touch with Wonderful. you on, Wonderful. and I'll share it with you. And we have a gift for coming on since you do wow. antiques. This was a kind of an antique uh, license plate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. Welcome. From I love flagandbanner.com. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, thank I love, you so much, I love Roy. being here, Carrie. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you for being my first I, guest in the Dreamland. Ballroom. I know. I'm excited and honored. Wow. I had to keep myself from telling some stories about us. I've bought stuff from you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I accidentally kept calling you one time because I had you in my phone as the wrong I person. I know. I lost my favorite I story. Thought, I, I know. I forgot about that too. We had a three-week relationship. And didn't even know it. Yeah, I didn't even know it. Because I didn't know who you were. Yeah, that's right. It took us a while to figure it out. <laughs> All right. Uh, my guest next week is going to be Jim Daly. He used to be our mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Good mayor. He was a good mayor. And uh, he is now the tourism director director for the state of Arkansas. His father owned Daily Office Supplies, which was in downtown Little Rock, and just a Staples in downtown Little Rock. Staples, no pun intended, in downtown Little Rock <laughs> forever. But uh, when he comes on, I think we'll talk probably about the natural state and hear all the stuff yeah. that's going on and where you can visit and what you can do. You can take vacations right here in Arkansas, and they're beautiful. If you have a great entrepreneurial story that you would like to share with me, I'd love to hear from you. Send a brief bio or your contact info to questions. It's questions with an S at upyourbusiness.org. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program's been about you, you're right, but it's also been for me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening, and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your life, or your independence. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business.